Okay, so uh, continuing with the trend of having you all introduce yourselves and what you're interested in and what you want to take out of the class. Yesterday we had uh, Ben and Ben and Brian. Uh, would anyone like to introduce themselves today? Maybe three people. <laughs> What's your last name? Kind of mentioned that we added manufacturing for cars. We just kind of want to learn a bit more about material properties, how how and why different metals have different stiffnesses, strengths, and whatnot. Okay. Yeah, we will focus mainly on aluminum and steel here, which are the main most, most, most common engineering materials. Yeah, but we can talk more in depth if you're interested at some point. Anyone else? <coughs> My name is Ben, and um, for a trade again, doing a lot of Ben's videos. <laughs> I guess um, so. I'm interested more in manufacturing and mechanical engineering, so seeing how to select the correct material and how to manufacture it and how to put it together so that your product does what it needs to do. Cool. Yeah. Um, that CES software will be definitely useful, and then I'll the theory in this class, so you can actually understand it. Um, okay, maybe one more person. Oh, hey, my name's Max Ferguson. Uh, I'm a transfer, and I want to do space stuff, pretty much. <laughs> like, uh, like precision space structures. <coughs> and so for this class, um, I would love to learn more about how to make things really light and control yeah. And also, somebody mentioned uh, the communication piece. <laughs> I think that was, yeah, I think you've mentioned Ben, yeah, or Benjamin, either, okay. Okay, cool. So, uh, let's talk about the last concept from our mechanics basics, uh, and that is strain energy density. So, uh, yesterday we went through Engineering, stress and strain, give a general definition for those. Young's modulus, shear modulus, bulk modulus, Poisson's ratio, how those all relate, the, the lame constant, um, <laughs> lame constant. Um, okay, so uh, strain, energy, density. Cool. So when we deform a material, we are doing work to that material. So um, I apply some sort of force to that material, it, it displaces some distance, I'm thereby doing a work, and the amount of work that I'm doing to the material gets stored or transferred as energy. So um, in our stress-strain curve, doo -doo -doo, we're gonna look at the engineering one. Uh, we had our linear elastic region, which is what most of the class is gonna focus on. Uh, some plastic yield point, some large strain behavior, potentially necking in the specimen. Um, this is some strain, this is some stress. Now I want to figure out how much energy is actually being stored in this material. So um, it, we can say our, our work in the material, this is, I'm going to give a very hand wavy uh, explanation here. Uh, and if you want a little bit more depth, you can go through it in the book. But um, our, our work is our force times our distance um, from general physics. Our stress here uh, is force over area. <coughs> Strain is the distance or the, the change, in, change in length here, which is also the distance that it's displacing um, over L naught. So uh, this is for engineering definitions. So it's actually convenient to just take that work, say that it's some energy, and say that our, our strain energy density now, because we have now the amount of work that's going in per unit volume is some stress times strain. Or because these aren't necessarily directly related, related I want to find out how much stress is being applied through the body. So I want to basically find out the stress distribution relative to the strain in 
uh, in a material that's being deformed. Uh, in the linear elastic regime, so this now is strain energy density. Um, so it's basically the amount of work that I'm putting into the material divided by the volume of the material itself. So in our linear elastic regime, the strain energy, I have uh, my stress is directly related to my strain uh, via a Young's modulus, uh, at least here in this linear elastic region, or at least that's the approximation we're going to be making as engineers. Um, that means that this has a relationship. So I can say for linear elasticity, um, my u, oh, my u is e epsilon d epsilon, which is just then one half e epsilon squared. Um, or if I want to write it slightly differently, um, stress squared over 2e. Both of these are, are different ways of representing strain energy density in a linear elastic body. So this is a nice convenient general definition um, that kind of commonly gets used. So you'll see this or just in general, one half stress strain um, is probably a simpler way to write it. Uh, you'll see this definition for strain energy a lot in a body. Uh, just remember that it's for linear elasticity and it's because we're integrating the, uh, the stress relative to the strain in a body. Um, there's a metric for this uh, that people commonly use uh, known as the modulus of resilience, which I call modulus of resilience. So this modulus of resilience, now I'm actually going to define as looking at the our stress strain curve here, um, is actually the area under the curve up until the point of elastic deformation. So at that yield point, which we'll call sigma y, let's put things around a little bit. So um, my my at my yield strength, um, the area under the curve up until there is is known as this term called the modulus of resilience. So I can call that U R. Uh, it's still linear elastic up to that point. I can now just actually plug in my my yield strength because it's basically it's this triangle. So now that uh, I have sigma y squared over 2e, um, or one half stress strain, uh, where this is the yield strain here in the body. There we go. So it's basically the area of a triangle, um, the area under the curve. Nice correlation there. Um, there's one other metric that kind of comes up a lot. Um, and that's the tensile toughness. So modulus of resilience, this is how much energy you can put into a material before it starts plastically deforming, which is a useful quantity to know. Um, the tensile toughness, which I will note is very different than the fracture toughness we'll be talking about later. Uh, tensile toughness. Now, uh, UF is going to be the full area under the curve prior to fracture. So from zero to epsilon failure of sigma t epsilon, um, whoop, tensile toughness, that same integral, but now all the way up until failure, where my failure point, sorry, I'm going to take it off the screen, um, is now this uh, point where I have fracture of the body. Uh, and this now is just the area under this whole curve. So uh, two useful quantities, modulus of resilience, tensile toughness, 
this is how much energy the body can absorb before it uh, plastically deforms. This is how much it can absorb before it breaks entirely. Um, this, as a note, um, is uh, very different. Different from fracture toughness. Which we will talk about um, in the last, what, maybe seventh week, I think we start getting into fracture toughness. Yeah, cool. So just a couple general definitions. Uh, so now this is the last section of the first part of the notes. Uh, so my, my chapter one in the notes. Have people been getting online, seeing those? They've been, you've been able to find them all right. Have they been useful? Okay, cool. At least one person finds them useful. That's good enough. Um, okay. So um, now we'll start getting into a totally new topic where we'll use some of these concepts, but um, do something different. And that is beam bending. So let's jump up. Make sure this is straight. Um, so now this is my my chapter two in the notes. We're going to get into beam bending. Cool. So um, beam bending is something you should have seen pretty extensively in CE 220, if I right there. Okay. So this is something that ideally will be familiar to most of you. For those of you who hadn't taken 220, uh, how have you seen beam bending? Or is there anybody who hasn't seen beam bending at all? I know there was at least a couple people who brought it up to me. Or nobody wants to admit that they haven't seen beam bending. OK. OK, cool. Um, so the actual beam bending that we'll use in the class uh, for next week's lab is three point and four point bending, which is a fairly simple case. Um, I'm going to go through kind of most of the theory uh, for where it comes from, so you'll get a good background. Um, I was actually still looking for a good textbook reference on this. There's so a uh, little bit of history. The, the beam bending that we're going to be talking about today is also known as Euler Bernoulli beam theory. Um, Euler Bernoulli beam theory, which uh, Leonard Euler and I think Daniel Bernoulli, um, one of like the 10 Bernoullis that are out there that have some contribution to science, uh, came up with this theory in 1750. So same Leonard Euler that is in a lot of math stuff, um, just one of those dudes whose names pops up all over the place. Um, so they came up with this theory in 1750. It didn't actually become used very heavily until the 19th century, actually uh, when the Eiffel Tower was being built. So a lot of the, uh, it was kind of around and, and it was it was there as a theory, but um, people didn't really see the practical utility until um, Eiffel built that giant skyscraper uh, that was made out of beams. And so he used a lot of euler Bernoulli beam theory in designing that structure. Uh, and all of a sudden people were like, oh, this is super useful. So Euler-Bernoulli beam theory uh, is when people talk about beam theory, the primary thing that they are talking about. Um, it's very useful for long slender beams. So here I have a ruler. Basically, we're going to be talking about um, how a long slender member responds to an applied force. Um, there's another beam theory uh, called Timoshenko beam theory which is a special, uh, uh, I guess Euler-Bernoulli theory is a subset of Timoshenko theory, where uh, if you have uh, a short stubby beam, Timoshenko beam theory can be used. So uh, as long as you have a long slender beam, which we'll define uh, in a second what a long slender beam is, uh, this Euler-Bernoulli theory is the one that you use. Um, otherwise, Timoshenko beam, Timoshenko beam <coughs> theory is the one that comes in. So. Uh, when we're talking about beams, 
So this is a, a subset of linear elasticity, or a, a simplified case of linear elasticity, because we're going to assume that our beam acts as a one-dimensional body. So we're going to ignore any of the three-dimensional stresses, any of the weird distortions and shears and other directions, and we're just going to look at uh, deflection along one axis. So for beam theory, I'm going to draw a schematic beam here. In this beam, we're going to have a neutral axis. Uh, and what I basically want to figure out, let's draw a coordinate system now. Um, I'm going to define here the x-axis as the axis along the length of the beam and z as the downward deflection direction. Uh, this gets switched up depending on exactly who you're talking to um, or exactly what reference you're using. Uh, and basically we want to figure out if I have some force being applied to this beam, how is it going to deflect? So if I apply some force distribution, which I'm going to call Q of X here, what, how is this thing going to change shape? So it's going to deflect downward some amount. There we go. Uh, and I want to know relative to my initial position, what is my deflection W of X um, as a function along the beam length? X, Z, uh, I'm going to give this beam an initial length L here, and I'm going to say this is for some arbitrary cross-section beam. This is now my Z. This is Y. And this is some cross-section. Cross there we go. Cool. Um, so in general, what we're trying to do so we, we're going to assume that this acts as a one-dimensional body. I'm going to ignore any axial displacement of any of the points along here. I'm only going to look at where does one point along the neutral axis end up if I deflect it downward with a certain force distribution on the body. Most of the time, these, this isn't going to be a, a uniform force. There's only a couple of special cases where that's actually useful. Uh, for example, like a, like a windmill, uh, windmill beam under winding, wind loading, where you kind of have a uniform or maybe distributed force. Uh, most of the time for engineering structures, it's going to be point loads at the end or in the middle of beams. Uh, and so those are, those are the cases that we'll actually be looking at. But I'll give you a general definition for things um, along the way. So there's one major assumption that goes into beam theory. Um, well, first that we're, we're dealing with slender beams. Uh, but that slender beam assumption, uh, or there's another assumption that requires that slender beam assumption, um, and that is that plane sections of the beam remain plane. So uh, one big assumption, oh, that's the assumption. Uh, Plane sections normal to neutral axis remain plane after loading. So that means if I have some beam, which I'm now going to draw as a one dimensional line here. Um, and I apply some, I, I have here now some sections. These are all at 90 degrees. When I deflect this beam, do, 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 do. Oh, let's draw that a little bit better. Nope, I just do the exact same thing. Cool. I'm not going to try it any better. 
those plane sections of the beam remain at that same normal that they were before. So this simplifies our analysis a lot. This means that um, I can assume the stress distribution across the across the width of the beam is uniform or is linear. Uh, stress across thickness is linear. Uh, in general, it simplifies a lot of my analysis. So I have my little uh, paper ruler diagram. So these are all roughly normal to the beam before we start, and then when we bend, they stay approximately normal to the beam. So this is a nice example of a, of a slender beam that's being bent. Um, the variant of Timoshenko beam theory, so um, that Timoshenko beam theory d breaks this assumption down. So that's not a requirement in, in more advanced theories. And you can think of this like, uh, so if I have a really short stubby block, basically, um, that I then want to apply a, a, some downward displacement on, what's going to happen is not necessarily uh, that it will uniformly bend. So if I have uniform sections going down like that, um, it won't necessarily kind of uniformly bend down like this. Um, this isn't very realistic because that means you're applying a lot of compression there and a lot of tension there. What's actually going to happen uh, is this is going to shear. So you'll get something a little bit more like that. And then those sections now here will no longer be at a 90 degree angle. So this, this one, they stay at 90 degrees, which is not realistic. That's what's actually more likely going to be the deformation. Um, so uh, I have, well, let's, yeah, let's give one definition for what actually is a slender beam. Uh, so if I define the height of a beam, um, so I didn't give this one here, uh, let's define some height h or some thickness t or some, some width direction. Um, if I have now uh, my, my slender beam assumption, Uh, what I'm going to call a slender beam is when I have my h over l as being something much less than 1. So it has the, the thickness of it is much less than the length. Generally what that means in practice uh, is if my h over l is somewhere less than like 0 0.1. So if it's like a 10 to 1 aspect ratio mem slender member then you can approximately count it as a, as a beam that you could use Euler-Bernoulli theory for. If it's much shorter than this, uh, or if it's a little bit shorter than this, you can use Timoshenko theory, and that'll work. And if it's way shorter, then you just can't use <coughs> beam theory at all, uh, and you'll have to model it as a solid body. So I want to drill this in because I think it's an important concept. So I'm going to ask a conceptual question now. Um, have you pull up, pull everywhere. My computer wants to wake up. Cool. So, oh, that's okay. Sure, why not? Um, so, for this poll everywhere. Does that, so if I have an Euler beam and a Timoshenko beam, if I, if I assume that all those plane sections remain plane or that they don't remain plane, which do you think will be stiffer and which do you think will be less stiff or more compliant or less compliant? So will an Euler beam be less compliant, more compliant than a Timoshenko beam? So it's compliant, stiffer? Uh, compliance is one over stiffness of more deformable. 
So do you think an Euler beam will be more deformable or less deformable than a Timoshenko beam, just given that theoretical framework, given that assumption that my plane sections are remaining plane? Are you talking about beams of different lengths or beams that are different assumptions? Under different assumptions. So the same, same beam uh, that, I guess, yeah, it would have to be a short beam for you to actually see a difference, but same beam with, with and without that plane section assumption. There's still, still some questions on compliance. <laughs> do, do people actually want me to define compliance a little bit better? Okay, so um, stiffness here we're gonna define as like a Young's modulus. Compliance is just one over that Young's modulus. So it's the inverse of stiffness. Something that is more compliant is softer. So like rubber is more compliant than metal. Um, does that help clear things up a little bit? Uh, do you want me to go in a little bit more depth? Maybe. Okay. So uh, I'm not going to give you the answer right away, but I'm going to have you talk to people to figure this out. So I'm going to show you this little schematic again, uh, and then have you turn to people next to you to, to think about this. So basically what I'm asking is if I have this sort of a short, or any sort of a beam, but this is a, a more exaggerated example. Um, if I apply a force to this and I assume that it's deforming like this versus, I, versus assuming it's deforming like this, which one do you think will have a stiffer response? Or which one do you think will have a more compliant response? Which one do you think will be easier to deform? Um, so go ahead and take like a minute and talk to the person next to you and then potentially change your answer based on that. Okay, let's bring it back together. So, if, I'm going to give you all a chance to, if, based on your discussions, it sounded like the, there were some interesting ones going on. Um, I'm going to give you a chance to change that answer that you had put previously. Um, I'll give you like 10 seconds before I switch back over. Uh, because there was a there was like a 60 30 split it looked like between uh, 60 30 60 40 70 uh, 65 30. <laughs> oh I can actually yeah because then 10 percent didn't know what compliance were uh, um, yeah so the, the class was a bit divided on on whether that assumption would make things more or less compliant which may just be because of the way that I'm defining this problem a little bit fuzzy. Let's see if that changed at all. Okay, so there's still a pretty even split. Interesting. So um, that assumption. So assuming that an Euler that a beam is deforming. Let's jump back to our document camera. Um, oh, okay. Um, so here when I. I guess all of mechanics, 
I'm, I'm making assumptions about how bodies are going to be deforming based on my applied stresses. So when I actually deform something, it does what it's going to do. So it's just, it is deformed. Um, and then the way that I understand how it's deforming, the way that I study stresses, the way that I try to model when it's going to break um, is based on all these theories that we develop. Um, so there are some experimental techniques where you can see kind of what's actually going on. Photoelasticity is one of them. So then you, you can actually see what the stress distribution is in a beam and bending. Um, but numerically and analytically, we have to try to come up with the best way to, to reproduce the behavior that we see experimentally. So um, that's my little tangent for theory stuff. Uh, it turns out when I make this Euler bending assumption, uh, this will actually be stiffer than this beam. If I were to try to deform a short stubby beam um, without letting it shear, uh, then it'll it'll deform a lot. It, it'll be a lot more difficult to deform. You can think about it like a deck of cards. So if I have a deck of cards and I and I uh, want to take that deck and, and move it downward, all of those all those cards are going to shear relative to each other. But if I glue those cards together, now those cards can't shear anymore, and it'll it'll deform out kind of in the way that this is. So I'm actually this uh, Euler model will inevitably or generally be uh, stiffer uh, than the Timoshenko model, or the Timoshenko model will be more compliant than the Euler model. Um, so uh, just a, a thing to be thinking about as we're doing this. Does that mean that the Euler model overestimates beam strength? Uh, no, but if you have a short beam, it will overestimate how stiff the response of a beam is. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, it doesn't, Euler theory itself doesn't explicitly deal with, no, it does deal with strength. Um, yeah, it, but the, the main result is you'll, you'll predict your structure to be stiffer than it actually is. That seems really bad. Generally, yeah. <laughs> this is, so you can, all model, uh, there's a, there's a fun saying, all models are wrong, but some are more useful. So um, all of the theory that we'll be going through here, I mean, this, this is a theory from 1750 that people have now kind of developed into a full-fledged thing that is used in engineering. Um, but it's, a, so it's a very simple theory that uh, mathematicians and physicists came up with a long time ago, but it's still actually really useful for long slender beams. There are just certain cases where it's not. <laughs> and it's important to, to be thinking about what those cases are. Yeah. I guess so initially I was thinking maybe a lot of people were thinking it was under compression at the bottom, so you're kind of like seeing compliant beta, but beam compliance is actually a really thing now because like you have a curve as opposed to a straight line, so it's, it's about the vertical displacement though, right? Uh, I'm, con I'm confused about your like question. I don't know, I might be totally off too, but because uh, like if you have a more compliant beam, it's going to bend more under load. But if you have like if you have this kind of a curve, then at any point along there, it'll displace less than the line at the bottom, right? Yes, I think. Maybe we can talk more about it after. Yeah, I I, I feel like you're on the right track, but. talk about it more afterward. Um, okay, so Euler-Bernoulli theory, there's one equation that you need to know to find out all of, or like, all of the deflection. So what we're trying to do is figure out how this body is going to deflect relative to an applied load. Uh, and there's one ODE that defines that. Uh, and so that governing ODE, uh, formally written out, uh, d squared, or what's Right, governing ODE. Uh, D, DX squared, E, I, D, W, DX equals Q. So, uh, 
this is the one equation that you need to solve to actually get all of the beam deflections. Um, did you all go through this? Have you seen this equation before? Okay, so this is not, for those of you who have worked on beam theory, seen this one. Um, generally for a body, so here now, this E is a Young's modulus. I'm still writing on the screen. Uh, it is Young's modulus. Uh, and I here is area moment of inertia. Of inertia, inner, inertia, um, which is defined as the second integral of the distance from the neutral axis of the beam. Most of the time, you'll never actually use this formula. Um, what is useful is for square beams and circular beams. So uh, for a square beam with H and with B, um, or for a circular beam uh, with 2R, or diameter 2R, uh, this one I is equal to uh, BH cubed over 12. And for a circle, it's pi r to the fourth over uh, four? Four, yes. So those are kind of the two big equations that we'll actually be using. Um, what's important to note from here uh, is that this is changing based on, so um, if, I, if I decrease the, the height or the radius of a beam that I'm taking and bending, the eventually the stiffness will find uh, is decreasing cubically. Um, so if I make the beam half as thin or half thick, I guess, um, then it'll be eight times less compliant. Uh, and that's coming from this area moment of, area moment of inertia. Um, I saw... Uh, yes? D squared, oh, is it? Yeah, I missed the squared on top. Thank you. Yes. Um, generally, this equation is written out. So uh, across the, the length of a beam, we're going to assume that the Young's modulus stays constant and that the area moment of inertia stays constant. Although, if it changes, you technically have it in there and still solve this ODE, it just gets really gross really fast. Uh, so most of the time, what we have is, uh, we'll show this as EI uh, D fourth W D X to the fourth. Um, and most of the time, we're actually not going to have a distributed load Q on there. So Q um, is that distribution along the length. Most of the time, it'll just be a point force somewhere at the end or in the middles. Uh, so we won't, Q will technically be a direct delta, which we're not actually going to get into. I'll just show you how you use it to solve the boundary conditions. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so so most of the time it's actually represented in a simpler form, which is a little bit easier to solve, but um, yeah. So we only have a couple minutes left. Let's define some general relationships, uh, and then next week, we'll, or next week, tomorrow, uh, we'll talk about how that solution gets solved. So there we go. Uh, so what do I want? <coughs> if I have now some small section of a beam, uh, so let's say I have a beam impending beam that's getting bent downward like that, not very uniform. Uh, and I just want to look at a small section of this beam. Inside this beam, there's some moment M and there's some shear action Q. Uh, let's define this up. No, down here. M. Uh, and then some shear action Q. Here, these mo this moment and shear are defined relative to my deflection. 
so my moment here, or my shear, is the third derivative of my deflection, negative e i d cubed w d x cubed. My moment is the second derivative in there, e i d squared d x squared. Um, because what I'm actually measuring is a deflection. Do, do, do. Oh, bring this thing all over the place. So what I'm looking for is, is my deflection w of x. Um, I can define my angle change phi. Um, so this is uh, shear force. This is a moment bending moment. Uh, my angle of deflection, my deflection angle, V uh, is dW dx. So this is uh, angle. Uh, yeah, and then for the most part, uh, when we're actually again solving these things, we'll ignore the distribution along the length. Um, so that's probably the stopping point. Um, tomorrow we'll go through the solution and I'll, I'll try to show you three and four point bending um, solutions. Can you just try to, um, on the diagram, show where phi is? Uh, yes. So that would be the angle change relative to oh, that. <laughs> yes. So it's uh, the angle there. So here, um, I guess if I had a cantilever beam, for example, my phi here would be zero because it's rigidly fixed. And then at the end, it would be some angle relative to the, to the neutral axis of the beam. No. Yeah, because our W also isn't constant.